around you like Sykes. For president. Hang out the banner and beat the drum. We'll take Ike to Washington. You know I had to do it. I love that commercial, and I'm going to post a link to the full I Like Ike commercial in the description below. But happy President's Day, my fellow Americans. I can think of no better way to celebrate President's Day than to tell you about my favorite president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, also known as Ike. Let me start with a biblical quote from the book of Joshua that I think is relevant to Eisenhower's leadership. From Joshua 6. Therefore, be very steadfast to observe and do all that is written in the book of the Law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right nor to the left. As Moses, of course, had the laws that he gave from God, we have the U.S. Constitution, and we have, of course, our traditions uh, maintaining the balance of power between the three branches. And Eisenhower did this all while forces on the left wing and the right wing were trying to pull him astray. Let me start by talking about the right wing and then I'll get to the left. The right wing as we now know it was starting to take shape. The right wing largely consisted of these McCarthyites, the kind of people who spoke of small government but wanted endless wars overseas at the time to stop the communist menace. Now, now it's terrorism. They're always looking for some new group of people to be afraid of to justify more wars. They also use it to justify the surveillance state and further erosion of our civil liberties. That's the right wing that Eisenhower was having to keep at bay. There was the more moderate version, you might say uh, Fox News to McCarthy's Rush Limbaugh. The National Review would be the more moderate right. Uh, they didn't go as far as McCarthy, but they often criticized Eisenhower for not being more involved militarily with the world and for not implementing tax cuts, even though Eisenhower was struggling to balance our budget. Franklin Roosevelt, by the way, left us with the largest national debt in our entire nation's history, so Eisenhower was trying to do something about that, and he did. Now, on the left, definitely in its infancy at the time, I mean, at least the left that we currently know, the left we now know sometimes referred to as cultural Marxism. Um, it's the left of identity politics. It's the left that finds oppressed groups of people, calls them minorities, makes them feel like victims, and largely capitalizes on their plight and on their desire for equality, which they certainly deserve, but capitalizes on that to push their real agenda, which is usually expansions of government, further centralization, and further erosion of other civil liberties, such as, in our present day, a cake maker's right not to participate in a gay wedding, for example. So, the left and the right, who to this day threaten to rip our country apart, Eisenhower, more than any president, stood up to both of them, and that's why I admire him. Um, I wrote some words very carefully that I'm going to read because I put a lot of thought into these and I want to say it just right. Ike was the great balancer, moving us cautiously and peacefully forward in a chaotic political sea of clashing ideological waves. And without further ado, let me talk now about how he did that, what he accomplished. Um, starting from when he was still a general, during World War II we needed all able-bodied men out there fighting, and that included black men. After fighting for our country, and so many of them dying for our country, um, they had every right to come back and demand the kind of equality that they had fought for over in Europe against the Nazis. Eisenhower, as general, started experimented with, experimenting with racially integrating our military, and he had great success. As president, he started immediately pushing for racial integration of military bases and Washington, D.C. By keeping those goals limited, he was able to win the support of the NAACP and also win the support of many moderate Democrats. I want you to keep in mind that in those times, Democrats were largely racial segregationists. Furthermore, by maintaining the respect of white moderates, he was able to make a lot of progress towards racial integration without causing our whole country to just rip apart at the seams. He was always able to be perceived as that cautious moderate while in reality making much greater steps than people realized. Um, first, he appointed Earl Warren to the Supreme Court and he was instrumental in the Brown v. Board of Education ruling. That was the ruling that ensured racial integration of public schools. In 1957, Eisenhower was the first U.S. president to use the force of military to escort 
black students into a historically white school. Had someone more radical done the same thing, we might have had armed rebellion. But because it was Eisenhower, and the segregationists, I mean, they didn't like it, but they realized there was nothing they could do about it. So there's his civil rights accomplishments. Um, another important accomplishment was, I mentioned, I think I mentioned the national debt left to us by Roosevelt, the greatest national debt in our entire nation's history. Well, Eisenhower had to resist forces on the left and right in order to achieve a balanced budget, and he actually paid off some of our debt. Even though he was a fiscal conservative in the truest sense, Eisenhower did make two very important investments. One of them was in education. Um, he did provide many science scholarships. And the other major investment, perhaps more important, is the interstate highway system. During World War II, he admired the Audubon he saw in Germany and decided to do something like that here. We take that for granted now, but the interstate highways make it possible for us to transport goods very quickly all across the country. And they were therefore instrumental in making us the economic envy of the world. Even to this day, we are still the largest economy in the world, even as we slowly squander the prosperity that Eisenhower and America's greatest generation left us. As for the Soviet Union at the time, he largely kept them contained. There were forces on the right that wanted him to be more aggressive and start just attacking, attacking. But we all remember what happened when we eventually did that, the Vietnam War. Eisenhower kept us out of Vietnam. But then we get into Vietnam under a little bit under Kennedy, more under Johnson, and most of us have regretted it ever since. Uh, it was a national and international embarrassment, sunk us deep into debt, I think partly was responsible for the stagflation of the 1970s. Eisenhower knew that the best way to ultimately defeat the Soviet Union was basically to keep them contained and let them eventually destroy themselves, which is what did happen. Which is what did happen. He maintained a strong military, but it was also a sustainable military. The kind of military that we could afford to support and balance our budget and pay off some of our debts. Our military budget now is so large that not only is it the largest in the world, but it could fund China's military four times, and China has the second largest military in the world. Um, if you take the second, uh, take the next 19 largest military budgets in the world and you combine them, they're still not as big as our military budget is by itself. We spend over $650 billion a year just on our military. That's not even counting taking care of veterans and everything else associated with it. Um, our civil liberties are being eroded because of fear of terror, and the terrorists are nowhere near as formidable as the communists were, and we got through that. Sometimes the greatest courage comes not from those who shoot first and aim later, but from those who resist pulling the trigger when everyone is telling you to pull the trigger or be a coward. Eisenhower was willing to be called a coward for the good of the country. He knew that nothing would come of those brush fire conflicts with the Soviet Union that the right was pushing for, and we would later learn that in Vietnam. You'd think we would have learned it in Korea, but apparently not. Then there were those on the left, of course, those who push identity politics, who prey on victimization. Well, Eisenhower knew that we needed to move towards racial equality without allowing their radical agenda to take over the civil rights movement. So, to lay out Eisenhower's achievements as president, he may really laid the groundwork for the federal government's role in the civil rights movement. He resisted calls to war and as a result was able to pay off some of our debt left over from World War II. He built the interstate system that is absolutely the lifeblood of the American economy as it was then as it is today. And he also invested in science scholarships that definitely helped fuel a lot of innovation in years to come, perhaps including the internet revolution. This internet revolution today has made it possible for young people, from myself and younger, to get the kind of information and points of view that our parents could not. Unfortunately, our parents are stuck with the mainstream media, and few of them have opened up to the internet. 
As a result, they are easily manipulated by certain demagogues masquerading as news. Whether it's the half-truths being spun by Hannity, or those that moo in unison with a certain mad cow on MSNBC. These are the kinds of forces that threaten to tear our country apart. And only the kind of nonpartisan leadership provided by Eisenhower, a man who was registered as a Republican, but could acknowledge the good and bad qualities of both dominant parties, only that kind of leadership can lead us away from the partisanship that's ripping us apart and lead us towards a new American golden age. I think we can do it, but in order to do it, we have got to stop listening to the demagogues and we have got to break free of the left-right paradigm. That's why I still like Ike. Happy President's Day. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together.